you or someone you love needs help for an addiction, where do you turn? Foundations Recovery Network offers individualized treatment for the whole person. Our goal goes beyond short-term sobriety. We address substance abuse and co-occurring mental health issues together, providing a firm foundation for long-term recovery. The first step is often the hardest, but we're here with a free assessment, insurance information, and treatment options. Our confidential helpline is available 24-7, so call 877-714-1318 and discover the Foundation's Recovery Network difference today. Yo, what's up? This is Jacoby from Papa Roach. This is Ryan Lee. This is Wes. This here. is Bob Ford. This is Rich Roll, and you're listening to Sober Guy Radio. Radio. What's up? Thank you for tuning in today. Thanks to humans for bringing us in, and thanks to you for supporting the show. Today, we're going to dive into a conversation about working the steps with a sponsor and why having a sponsor or an accountability partner is a must. And uh, before I introduce our guest today, I want to tell you about the I Am Sober app. Have you checked out the I Am Sober app? If not, you can go to that soberguy.com right now and you can download it there for free. I Am Sober is helping thousands of people just like you get sober and stay sober. I always like to say it's not a magical app that's going to just save your ass. It's not all you're going to be able to use, but it's definitely a very positive tool that you can throw in there uh, for the rest of your recovery program. Like I said, best of all, it's free. You get an overview of your sobriety milestones. You can see how much money you've saved, and you can also get daily notifications to help keep you on track and headed in the right direction. So you can go to the app. Uh, you can get the app at the IamSoberApp.com website. That's IamSoberApp.com. I already mentioned you can go to that SoberGuy.com. You can download it there. And you can also find it on the iTunes App Store or the Google Play Store. Download the I Am Sober app today. Also, do you need help? Or do you have a family member or a friend who might need help? You can call Foundations Recovery Network today at one 714 1318 They have a confidential and private line. And uh, they have nationwide residential and outpatient facilities. We've been partnering with foundations now for a couple of years. Um, I have personal relationships with many of the folks over there. And I can tell you that they're awesome people. They're good people. They're about helping others. And they have plenty of resources to do that. So uh, if you are looking for, for someone to call right now in this moment, you can call them at one 714 1318 Once again, that's Foundations Recovery Network. All right. Love you guys. So stoked to, uh, for you to tune in today. I'm very honored to have a guy who's been a mentor to me. He's a friend. Uh, he's, he's just a great, great dude. He's always trying to do the next right thing. Um, and uh, not only is a friend, a mentor, he's also my sponsor. And that's Buddy. Buddy, it's great to have you back on the show, man. Thanks, man. I'm happy to be here, Shane. Thanks for I'm always honored when you ask me to be on the program. Good stuff, man. Yeah, and, and like I said, to, ha- to have you back, you, you've been on the show before. That was back um, uh, episode 117. That's titled, Do I Need a Sponsor? So we, we kind of jumped into that a little bit about what it is to have a sponsor, why you need one. And there was all kinds of other uh, uh, interesting content in that too. So um, I'll put the links to that in the show notes for those of you out there listening who'd like to go back and listen to that first episode if you haven't heard it already. Uh, man, I know we both kind of put some notes together for this. Um, you know, like, like, like we do sometimes before we, before we talk, um, at the same time, um, we're also about living in the moment and being in the moment and really staying focused on that, which is, is always good. And it's something I'm learning to do every day. Um, so why don't we just kind of start there? Like, what's up with you, buddy? Like what's, uh, what's going on? And, um, and, and, and we're going to talk about a little bit of step work. We're going to jump in specifically maybe to step 11 today. Um, but we really want to focus on, on God and just being open, um, to, to that higher power source and, and what's going on in the moment. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to hand it over to you right now, buddy. Uh, thanks Shane. You know, I really think that the program is about teaching me, uh, a lot of the programs teaching me to live in the moment because so much of my life was spent, uh, either in, you know, regrets of yesterday or worry and stress about tomorrow. And, um, and we, you know, we can talk about some Bible things on your show. I don't talk about that if I'm in a meeting or working with a sponsee that's not a, you know, not a Christian, uh, we'll talk about other things, but there's a lot of biblical basis too for, uh, for working the steps and the principles that we find in the program. Uh, but 
you know, learning learning what to do in the moment when there's when there's issues is really huge. Um, I have another sponsee that's got six months sobriety that uh, just recently found out his sister uh, is dying of alcoholism. And uh, she's in the hospital. They just moved her to hospice. And he's traveling out of state to go visit her and be with her when she passes. And he asked me, what do I do? Uh, and, you know, that's real life and real life happens. And, you know, we learn principles by working the program that, that really help with those things. Yeah. Um, like, for example, before, what I would have done would be to pray and just ha- ask God to help me with it, which is not a bad thing to do. But I've learned that my work in that is not me sitting waiting on God to do something for me. My work is for me to find someone to help. So what I do is I like to practice and I I read the message version of the new Testament. And there's one phrase that I keep coming back to, and it's called responsive obedience. And I really like to, and I really think that what God does for us is that when we, when we do Romans 12, which is, you know, we submit our moment and our everyday walking around life to God, that uh, then what we do is God starts changing us from the inside out, and we just respond when God puts something in front of us. So he prayed, and he asked God to put someone in his path that he could help. And his wife called him and said, listen, there's there's, uh, one of her friends who has a relative that's dying of uh, the same thing Hmm. and that she won't need someone to talk to. Will you call her? And so he got to talk to someone (laughs) that was going through the same thing he was going through and in doing so helped him. Wow. And and that's just how God works. You know, that's how God works. And um, I think the important thing with this is to remember that I I believe God's there to help us if we'll just give him room. Yeah. You know, um, we find ourselves full of care when we're cared for, Uh, when we when we show care uh, and we're full of care for somebody else. And that leaves room for God to come in and care for us. So I, I think it's all about when we're in the moment to say, "Okay, God, how can you use me? Because uh, the whole program's about cleaning us up and getting us ready to where we can be used and can be a yeah. benefit to somebody, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy to me sometimes how much, uh, you know, when we look into, the, into different programs um, and, and all, the, all the programs, no matter what they are, there's always an element of, um, of God in there. And I know for some people, because I've received feedback from it on, uh, you know, reviews or emails or whatever, that a lot of people have an issue with, with the God thing. And, um, you know, that that's to each his own, basically. I don't judge anybody for that. Like everyone's on their own path, but I do want to say this as a little disclaimer, because we're going to talk about God and we're going to talk about, um, you know, you've already, you've already mentioned a little bit, uh, within the Bible and whatnot, but this isn't about church number one. Okay. Like I'm, I wanted to, uh, to plug a book that I'm list that I'm, I, I say reading, but I'm actually listening to it because I, I have a hard time reading. Sometimes I, I, my mind tends to wander, but it's own the moment by pastor Carl Lentz. And there was one huge thing that one of the, there's a, a bunch of good stuff in there. I'm about halfway through it right now. Uh, so definitely check that out if, if, um, if you're interested in it, but there's one story specifically, he, he was talking about how he went to, um, you know, he ran into a guy, I think it was like at a, at a, at a seven 11 or a store or something. And he, and he invited the, the guy to church and the guy said, well, I don't like church. And, and he said, and, and pastor Carl said, you know what? I don't like church either. He said, in fact, our whole church is made up of, of a bunch of people who don't like church because it's not about church. It's not about stand sit. It's not about religion. It's not about obedience and obeying these laws. And if you don't obey these laws, you're not worthy to go to heaven or you're not worthy to live a, um, a fulfilling life. It's about a relationship with the higher power. So whether that's Jesus, whether it's um, you know, whatever God thing, whatever higher power that is to you, that's what it's about. That spiritual awakening. It's not about religion. It's not about a church. So I kind of just want to, um, and, and I, and I will say I go to a church called the father's house and it's a phenomenal church and it's about, you know, a relationship with God, a relationship with Jesus. So whatever that looks like to you, I would just encourage you like to think about that a little bit. 
you know, op- open that door up just a little bit and make it your own. Um, I just kind of wanted to put that out there, buddy, um, as we kind of continue on with this conversation, because I think it's an important aspect of, of what, um, of what we're talking about today and also what you and I talk about and the work that we do together on a weekly basis. We meet every Thursday and we talk about this stuff often. Uh, yeah, you know, and one thing that I remember uh, when I first came into AA, uh, my ideas of God changed greatly since then. Hmm. And uh, and I think everyone, when you get right down to it, has a little different conception of God, even in church, that different people think of God different ways. And what I realized with time, I saw people come into AA, they surrender to whatever they believed in. Some believed in a, in a Christian God. Some believed in, you know, a Buddhist, you know, which is really a no God, you know, believed in good. Yeah. Uh, some believed in all kinds of things. Um, and a lot did not believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. If you just want to throw it out there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, but their lives still changed. And I thought, how can this be? Because they're not able to check off all the boxes they're supposed to, to get God to do something for them. Hmm. All the stuff I was taught growing up that you had to do first. And once you did all these things and did them regularly and didn't do other things, then God would do for you what you needed, you know? So (laughs) I just said it wasn't the way that I thought it was supposed to be. So, um, I got to listening and what I realized was it really didn't matter what people believed as long as they believed there was a God and it wasn't them. Hmm. Believe anything as long as they learned to surrender and they got results. I mean, results with alcohol, results with every part of their life that they surrendered. So the point wasn't believing something particular. It was in, in learning how to let go in learning how to be powerless. Hmm. That's the issue. And for me, I had a very strong Christian God belief. If I'd have died, I would have gone to heaven in my, in my thinking. I mean, all I could check off all the boxes, but I couldn't quit drinking. And I didn't understand why, I mean, I prayed and prayed as sincere as I knew how to pray. God help me, God help me, God help me. And there was no help. So, you know, and that, I mean, that sounds, you know, almost sacrilegious, but that's true. I mean, that's just exactly like it was. What? Uh, I, well, I was going to say, I think kind of, I just wanted to touch on something because you've said it twice now about checking off the boxes. It's not about checking off the boxes and then asking for something. That's not what it's about. And, and you brought up the key word, which I always tell you, I always go back to out of all the great work we've done together and conversations we've had, it always comes back to being powerless. I feel like, you know, the more I learn a little bit each day, it always comes back to that. Just, I'm not in control anymore. I'm powerless over it. And when I'm in that, it's so much more peaceful. Just like they say in other religions, it's learning um, how to be the water. You know, it's learning how just to let it go and not hold on to things. Uh, uh, Another way it was put is to be a passerby, which in other words, just let those things just go on by. Don't uh, don't sit and hold on, hold on to anything. And it took me six years of going to AA and in and out, in and out, drinking and stopping over and over and over and over again uh, before I was able to put any time together of any consequence. And I've been sober now for nine years. So, uh, and six years before that, I was in and out, in and out. And I know what the difference was. And I remember the day it happened. Um, I finally got to the point that I said, you know, God, either you are or you're not. Either you're going to deal with this uh, or I'm going to end it. Hmm. Really do not have any options and I will not drink again. I am my, my ideas are over and I just gave up entirely. And when I did, it left. (laughs) (laughs) I'm saying that, you know, and I don't know why I could not have done that a long time ago. But I finally had to get, I think it's like uh, Paul talked about in the thorn in the flesh, his thorn in the flesh, 
was the weaker I get, the stronger I become. And I think that's a taste of the same thing in that we've got to learn how to let go so that our ideas and our solution is no, is no longer an option. Uh, and if we can't, and we've got to have things be miserable enough, long enough to where we will get to the point to where we will just totally give up. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, um, uh, when a soldier surrenders, they don't hold their gun and pick it back up again and, and keep kind of fighting when they surrender, they, they surrender, they, they put down all their weapons and they surrender, uh, what I kept doing was picking back up my weapons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I give up. I give up. No, no, no. no. Let me uh, shoot a little bit longer. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> and then, you know, as we work the steps, we find out that we're supposed to learn to practice these principles in everything else. And what I, what I found out was that if I learned to practice the same principles that helped me to get rid of alcohol, if I'll practice them in other areas of my life, then I can have the same peace in other areas of my life that, and the, the same relief that I got with alcohol. Yeah. So, and that's what I'm after. I want it. I want to eat. I want my life to be free. I want to not fight anything and anyone. And the way to do that is learn how to practice these principles in everything and it, it really is about learning to turn your will and your life over to the care of God, whatever God you believe in, in, in all areas of your life. Uh, that's why, and that's one thing I love about AA, is that in AA, you never, uh, no kind of God is pushed on you in any form or fashion. You're not given any tenet of what you've got to believe. There's no, there's none of that. Uh, but what you're not told what you've got to believe, but you've got to come to a point to where you believe that, uh, for most people that there's a God and that, that it's not you, that you learn a way that you're able to let go. And if you don't believe in a particular person or God is an entity, uh, you can believe, um, you can believe in good. That's what Buddhists do. They take the steps and everywhere that there's God, they replace God with good. Hmm. Uh, other people take the steps and replace God with love. And we've done that before yeah. in our talking, you know, where if you take the steps and I'm going to flip over there real quick and give you, uh, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of love as we understood it. See, I mean, it works. Yeah. It works because what we learn is that we have to, we have to be servants that uh, uh, the greatest is going to be the least, that, uh, that if we want to get ahead, we, we've got to learn how to serve other people and how to love people. Uh, and what I have found is that my freedom grows as I serve one another in love. It's really simple that if I have issue, one thing uh, that we've talked about too, Shane, is uh, you know the proverbial fence that you've got to get over in anything in life. You've got this issue. Well, used to, I used to think, okay, uh, I go and I try and I believe and I pray and I confess and I go look up scripture and I, and I get all worked up and, and I put my faith out there and I believe God for whatever I need and what little bit I couldn't do, get almost over the fence. Then God had pushed me that little bit I needed to get on over. And that was my work was to do everything I could to make it happen. Okay. And that's what we're taught. And I believe a fallacy in, in our spiritual beliefs is that we've taken principles that we learn out in the world in business and we've applied them to our spiritual beliefs. And, and for me, they don't work. Uh, what I have to do instead is when I've got that proverbial fence to get over, before I even try to get over myself, I look around and I say, OK, God, who else needs to get over? And I'll see someone who needs to get over the fence. I go and help them, help them get over either they help me or somehow I really don't know how before I know it, I'm over the fence too. <laughs> yeah. But it originated from me going and looking for somebody I could help, not me doing everything I could for me. And then, you know, and not, not including anyone else in the scenario at all. Used to, it wasn't about anyone, but me still, Yeah. you know, so selfish. 
And then I just took Christianity and added and stayed selfish. I never learned that I had to switch and it had to go from being about me to about somebody else. And in all my relationships, I do the same thing. Um, anytime I talk to anyone, either I'm doing one of two things, either I'm trying to get from you or I'm trying to serve you. I can't do both at the same time. I can't love you and manipulate you at the same time. Uh, so in every relationship and I found in business, what would happen is that I would, um, uh, I would start asking people when, um, when we got through with business, I would say, is there anything else I can do for you? And before I'd never asked that question because I wasn't interested in what, what I could do for them. I was interested in what they could do for me. And as soon as I thought I'd pacified them, I wanted to, to get going. I didn't want to do anything else for them. Uh, you know, that was the reality, but yeah. then I started changing from the inside out as I started learning these things and, uh, learn how to turn my will and my life over to God's care. And that, that the key to making this for this working for me, uh, is to start, uh, putting others before me. Well, and, and, and much of, much of what you've learned through working with your own sponsor and I've learned from working with you and many others out there who have worked through the steps or are currently working through them is found in the step work. And we're going to get in um, to some of the some of the step work a little bit more in, in just a minute. But first, what I wanted to talk about um, with you is is powerlessness in finding a sponsor. So I really want to focus this, um, you know, to some to somebody out there maybe listening who is on the edge of like, they don't have a sponsor. Maybe they, maybe they're looking for one or maybe, maybe they don't have one. And you know, they, they just haven't, they haven't really, um, taken the time to, uh, actively think about having a sponsor or what it could do for them or whatever. Um, what do you think about sponsorship in general? And then also the powerlessness in finding a sponsor. I, um, I think it's very important that you have a sponsor. I, I don't know uh, anyone actually with long-term sobriety that ha does not have a sponsor, no matter how long they have been in the program, that has a good program that, that I would want, has something that I, that I would want for me. Um, and the thing we learn is that we're not, uh, we don't take the responsibility for getting anyone sober. Uh, when you sponsor someone, you're not taking the responsibility for getting them sober, nor are you telling them instructions on what to do. What you're doing instead is sharing how you did it. So, and you know, from us working together, when we talk about, um, some issue, I'll start with, well, this is what I did. Yeah. Or this, you know, I may make a suggestion, but what I normally do is talk about ex my experience, strength and hope. And that's what I talk about in meetings. If I share and those things, it's never giving advice. It's never um, going and, and telling someone what to do. And that way, if, if I share with you how I did it and you take that and you either apply it and work it or not, I don't have to take the blame if you get drunk, nor do I take the credit when you stay sober. Yeah. <laughs> See, so it keeps me out of pride and ego. And it keeps me out of discouragement, too. Yeah, that's so good. That's not my part. My part is not the result. My part is to share with you what, you know, my higher power's done for me. And then you can take that and do do with it. I hopefully apply it to your life. Now, uh, we do work the steps, which is huge. I think that's what AA is really about. I don't think it's about meetings. I don't think it's about it, it's about having a spiritual awakening. And that spiritual awakening happens from working the steps. I mean, step 12 says having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. So, yeah. you know, it's a get, have, waking up spiritually. And I think we're all asleep and we're all, all still asleep to a degree. And this is just one path to a spiritual awakening. There's all kinds of paths to waking up, but they all have some, some of the same elements. There's going to be an element of cleaning up your past. There's going to be an element of cleaning up your relationship with your higher power. And there's going to be an element of service. Yeah. So it's going to be those and ongoing relationships, good with, uh, with whatever God you believe in and good with other people. 
So uh, those things are going to continue, and and that's just waking up spiritually to what's going on around you. Now, finding a sponsor and wor- and working the steps with a sponsor. Um, I did not know what I wanted, what I needed for my first sponsor. Um, you know, you have these ideas of of who you know it would need to be, um, and normally it's not that. Uh, nor- normally it's somebody totally different than that. But what what I what I did was I told God I was powerless over finding the right sponsor. So I used finding a sponsor. Uh, as an exercise in learning how to be powerless over something other than alcohol. So, you know, I was, I was learning how to be powerless over alcohol. Now I can learn how to be powerless over finding a sponsor. Okay. Then I can be powerless over my relationship with my wife or powerless over my relationship with my kids or powerless over work or these other things that we learn to be powerless over. And it's a good exercise for us. Can you, uh, can you kind of, because you and I, I've asked you this before too, and and I have a feeling that there there may be someone else out there listening, thinking the same thing. Um, can you kind of define powerlessness versus being a lazy ass? Because there's a difference, right? Like we don't want to get caught up in saying, "Oh, I'm just powerless over it." Like screw it, I can't do anything. I'll just, you know, that that's not what we're talking about. Like explain the difference in that, buddy. Powerlessness does not mean that I do nothing. Okay. Um, if you're powerless, you, you know, if you ever go to an AA meeting, uh, the last thing they say at the end, at our meeting, they say the Lord's Prayer, which, by the way, says, give us this day our daily bread. It's all plural, just like the steps are all about us, says we admitted. Yeah. So it's another you know, exercise that I need these other people, including a sponsor. And the last thing that you say is, keep coming back. It works if you work it, which is kind of cheesy sounding, you know? (laughs) Yeah. A little bit, but I get it. (laughs) Uh, But, uh, it says you work if you work it and I'm not going to cuss today, but (laughs) I was thinking to myself, what the blankety blank does work in it. If you work it, man, what is work? You know, what is the work, you know? And then I just couldn't, I did not know what the work was because I was working hard and it wasn't working. (laughs) (laughs) I was working hard not to drink and, and it was not working. So what am I doing wrong? Um, and I think, uh, what I learned that, that the work really was the powerlessness was that we changed our focus instead of the focus of God help me. It had to turn to God. How can I help someone else? And for me, I really like Romans 12. I use Romans 12 in my everyday. I have an audio, and I think I sent it to you. Yep. The message, I would urge anyone that has not read that, that the, if the Bible speaks to them, do uh, Romans 12, the whole chapter, in, um, in the message version. I'll listen to that as I finish my prayer and meditations every morning. I'll listen to the whole chapter of Romans 12. And it really outlines it very, very, very thoroughly as to the whole walk that we're to have during the day. And, and this is the real work, Shane. Uh, first you offer your moment up. Like I said before, you offer the moment God starts changing you from the inside out. Then you respond when you see the next right thing to do. Is there, do I, is there is there any relation to that, uh, to responsive obedience? Is that kind of what you're talking about with that? It's the same thing. Is is it? I don't believe we have to make anything happen, period. I believe we submit. I, I believe our, our attitude. I was raised thinking that I had an adult God. My relationship with, with God was an adult God with an adult son. You know, about, you know the age I was, yeah. you know. You know, and then if a, if an adult God, if an adult father with an adult son had things for them to do, they'd give you a checklist and you go and do these things. Right. And that's how I thought my responsibilities were as an adult child to an adult God, the father. So, uh, but now I'm thinking it's more of, we have to regress back to a two to three year old mentality and be that dependent on a, on a parent, just like a child is dependent on a parent. 
uh, and have that same level of, uh, of dependency. And that's, in my thinking, what powerlessness is, is learning how, learning how to share the things I have. What do you want for your three-year-old? They got to share what they have. You're going to provide everything they need. Yeah. Uh, and they need to do what you tell them to do. And it's always something they can do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you share your stuff and you enjoy yourself and you, and you eat your dinner. You know, that's about it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You know, that's it. And so I had all these other requirements on this, you know, and they just did not work. So I didn't know how to let God help me. And I think that's really what powerlessness, powerlessness is, is learning how to let God help us with something. Because I, I never learned really how to do that. When, uh, when, when we're talking about step work and going through uh, each step, um, is there a certain time frame? I feel like I always had this idea that like, well, I should be able to do it in this amount of time or that amount of time. And I think there's a general conception of that. Like, what's your take on, on the time thing for how long, like for someone out there saying, well, it's a pretty common question probably like, well, how long does it take to work the steps? I mean, personally, I don't think there's an answer to that, but I'm just curious on, on what, on what your take is. In my thinking, there's a couple of things. It's not okay. Number one, it's not, you wait two years and then work the steps or you wait a year and work the steps. My thinking and what I usually do with sponsees if someone asks me to sponsor them, they come in the program and they've got two or three weeks and they, they, they see they need a sponsor and someone asks me to sponsor them. Well, I start meeting with them immediately and we immediately start working the steps because the sooner you work, you get the relief from working the steps. You don't get relief from going to meetings. You might get a little bit yeah. of relief. You get a white, what do they call it? The pink cloud. The pink cloud. Yeah. But that pink cloud is eventually going to fizzle. You know, and you, you better have your feet on some solid ground when it does. So the way you get your feet on solid ground is by working the steps. You know, the promises that they read in meetings, those are halfway through working the ninth step. They're not about just going to meetings and everything's going to be unicorns and rainbows and everything's one. It's you got to work the steps. You got to get rid of that anger and resentment, learn tools to use, uh, to open that relationship back up with your higher power and then open up the relationship with the people around you. What so, about what about actually working the steps though? What about that aspect of it? Because I think there's kind of two elements to it. So how long, how long, you know, should I start working it? Is it a week into my recovery, or is it like you mentioned, two years? Um, you, you're kind of you're you're saying, and I agree with that that it should probably be sooner than later. But I'm I'm also saying like, what about actually going through the process? How long should that take? What I do. Um, I use the big book, the 12 and 12, uh, and I'll use some other literature. Uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll listen to Sandy beach. Who's a, yeah. who's a speaker. Uh, he'll talk about the steps. So we'll listen to his take on each step. Let's say step one, we'd listen to his 20 minutes, one week. We'd read the readings in the big book that have to do with step one. Then we'd read the 12 and 12 with step one. Then once we got through that and we thought we had a good, um, a good thorough foundation on step one. And I'm also using another book now. It's called 12 Step Sponsorship, How It Works by Hamilton B. Really good book uh, that outlines a lot. I'm using that in conjunction with, the, um, uh, with, with these other uh, writings. So that, and, and then if I've got someone who uh, is a Christian that the Bible speaks to them, I've got some biblical stuff for each step too. I don't mention that, and, and actually, I don't mention any of that in meetings. It's interesting. You know, the first AA meetings, uh, they used the Bible as their text. Hmm. That's what they used, and all the principles came uh, from the Oxford group. So it, it has biblical basis. Uh, the AA program does, but the great thing is that it also has basis in the other world religions, too. Uh, it just so happened the people who started AA uh, were Christians from the United States. So— hmm. That's why it's uh, Bible based, but it's not only that you'll see those same principles everywhere. So I'll take about three to four weeks a step and then we'd go and do the same thing for each step as we go and we don't stop and we keep meeting once a week. Uh, and sometimes we'd get through the steps faster and sometimes it'd be a little slower, but uh, usually a step a month, a step every three to four weeks complete 
uh, by the time we read all the literature and we go through it good and thorough and make sure that you have a good handle on it. Yeah. But it's, you know, but the real work, uh, gets into when you're doing the fourth, the fifth, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth steps. That's where the real work is of, um, uh, of learning how to, you know, get rid of the anger and the resentment and all the things a lot of people have carried since they were kids that, uh, that they never learned how to let go of. And, uh, and the whole program is just a series of learning how to let go. Can you, I, about, you know, it's all about learning how to be powerless over stuff. Well, it's funny as you just say that. So you're, you're talking that right. And then I'm listening and all of a sudden I just get this kind of light bulb go off right now too. Cause I'm, I'm thinking about the same thing. I've had that question before too. Well, well, how long, how long does it take to work the steps? Right. I'm kind of going back to that. Well, I just learned them right now. Like that goes back to setting expectations and being powerless. I shouldn't have any expectations on how long it takes to work this. I should just work them. And I should just let it kind of pan out just the way it's supposed to. When I do that, I'm actually practicing powerlessness instead of setting these um, kind of parameters around, well, it should take me three months to work, you know, this amount or, or whatever. And obviously, you got to have a plan, you know, too, at the same time, you know, you kind of want to have an outline. But like, I think more for me, it's more about the expectation thing. When I let those expectations go, things just kind of fall into place. Um, and that's just how kind of you and I ended up. Um, working together and becoming uh, friends and sponsor and sponsee is just from um, letting God do work in that because I didn't, you know, find you and you didn't find me from Georgia all the way to California completely, you know, by, you know, it wasn't a coincidence, I guess. I don't, I don't believe it was. That, that was us responding. It was God doing for us, Shane. <laughs> I love that. You know? One of my favorite lines. That's just God doing for us. <laughs> That's all it is. Because yeah. what we do is we submit. We what I did was I shot you an email. I heard you on your show and you were talking about you were carrying some things I knew that you shouldn't be carrying, and I just emailed you and said, "Hey, um, this has been my experience," and it spoke to you, and we hooked up and started talking. Yep. So, you know, we just responded is all we did when we is that responsive obedience again. Mm -hmm. Nothing to create or make happen. It was just, we just responded. It's all we did. Um, and, you know, these steps are the same way. Um, uh, they really work to, to clean your life up so that, so that you're able to respond. So, so you can be awake enough spiritually to where you can see what's going on, at least a little bit of it anyway. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's kind of shift this now into increasing contact with God. I thought that was one of the really good points that, that we had, it, kind of briefly spoke about before how does somebody increase their contact with God? And I don't think that there's, you know, I'm not looking for one specific right answer. I don't think that there is one. Um, but in your opinion, in your experience, buddy, like how has that, um, worked for you, uh, uh, becoming better connected to your higher power? It's changed over the years. Um, I, I think it comes first from, a desire to really um, work the program in every area of my life. Because one thing when you read different materials and, and work with different people, um, unless you want to, you know, a lot of people want to get, you know, the monkey of alcohol or drugs off their back. They don't want that. But do they really want to submit other parts of their life that they may enjoy? You know, other things that they know that they may do that's wrong, that they feel that, you know, that's not really something I want to submit to God. Okay. Um, and so for me, it was getting to the point to where, um, I would pray the prayer, God, I, I turn my will and my life over to you in all areas and help me to do that regardless of what it takes. When I could add, regardless of what it takes to any prayer, uh, that, that was really my submission, you know, that, that I was, that I was really wanting uh, the will of God in all areas of my life. So yeah. let, 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 let me back up really quick too, because I got ahead of myself on, on, on this question. And I wanted to point out beforehand step 11, because we said we were going to talk about that and it relates to this and, and we're actively working on step 11 right now for those out there listening. Like that's the step that buddy and I are working through right now. And, uh, it's sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 
And one of the first things I always loved when, um, you know, you and I first started working together is we had talked a little bit about prayer and meditation and, and what prayer looks like. And, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes had felt that I didn't really know how to pray or, or maybe that I was, my, my prayers just didn't make sense or whatever. And I remember you told me, you, and, and it was based on step 11. You said, Hey, Shane, just pray for God to show you your will and grant you the power to carry it out. I want you to do that for the next week or two weeks or whatever it was. And that's always stuck with me because I can always go back to that. And through all the chaos that goes on in my head and all the chaos going around in life, whether it's good chaos or, or, or some gnarly chaos that I'm having a tough time dealing with sometimes, like I can always go back to that and I can keep it real simple and I can just say, God, you know what? I can't handle this right now. Um, I don't want to handle this right now. So just show me my will and grant me the power to carry it out. Amen. And man, just saying that, the the relief the pressure that is relieved when i can like consciously do that in the moment is huge so i didn't mean to interrupt you there but i just i i wanted to kind of backtrack and i want to bring that out because i really do think that's such an important part of increasing that contact with your higher power you know i was out with my sponsor for lunch one day and this was years ago um and i, I happened to hear the guy next to us praying over his lunch with the people around the table and, and I listened to him pray and I thought, man, everything he prayed was for him. There was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was nothing there that was, you know, anything other than God, you know, bless me, do for me, do for my kids, do for this, do for that. Just do all for me. Amen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then I thought, I said, what if I went a week and didn't pray anything at all for me other than. What we learn in step 11, which is, it says there that that's the only thing that we're to pray for, really, is uh, praying only for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. Only. So, uh, oh, gosh, my prayers are going, and they got super short. So, one thing that you learn about step 11 is that through mer- prayer and meditation, uh, prayer is usually thought of as as us talking and meditation is us listening. So I do a lot more listening now than I do praying. Uh, I do a lot more of, uh, I'll let go of the things that I'm holding on to. I start my prayer time with that. And then, uh, I have a longer time of meditation, uh, afterwards, uh, in conjunction with that. Uh, so the, and a lot of times answers to things come while I'm meditating that I never, uh, never would have thought of before. Yeah. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll keep a notes beside me and I'll, I'll note something beside me as I, as I do my meditation time, but I just offer the moment up. And then a lot of times that'll follow out of that to where I can, I, I start offering the moment up during the day while I'm out doing, you know, whatever I'm doing that day, you know? So, um, does I it, think that, does this mean, so if I, wait a minute here, um, wait, 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 I may or may have not prayed to God for those Powerball numbers a couple of times, right? So I'm wondering if I pray for somebody else to win the Powerball. No, I'm just playing. It doesn't work like that though, right? We don't, we're, that's, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's not the manipulation business. You exactly, know? exactly. It's, it's God, you know, give me, uh, give me, you know what's best for me. I'm going to trust you to do what's best for me. I'm going to quit playing God. Yeah, really. give, up, give up control. Yeah, give up the control. You know, what I had found that I did was I just switched, you know, instead of, you know, I I was just still trusting God to do it all for me and no one else was factoring into the equation at all. It was still all about me. Yeah. You know, I had to change. I had to change. So, uh, and that's what step 11 is about really is, is waking up spiritually, you know, is learning how to increase that contact, uh, and, and walk a closer walk with whatever, you know, you believe God to be. I, um, I want to, I want to wrap this thing up here shortly, but before we do that, um, I thought maybe we could go over and, and, uh, maybe I could read a couple of, um, a couple of paragraphs from page 84 in the big book and then, and then maybe have, have you respond to them or maybe we can conversate about them a little bit too. Um, super, super important, uh, parts of the book. Um, you know, I know they're some of the, some of the main things that we talk about often. So, um, this comes from page 84, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to read two paragraphs here. So it says we continue to take personal inventory 
and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commenced this way of living as we cleansed, uh, I'm sorry, as we cleaned up the past. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. Let me repeat that. This is not an overnight matter. We've talked about that a lot and I'm, I'm sure we will continue to do so. Um, it should continue for a lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately and make amends quickly if we have harmed anyone. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone else we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. Um, man, that's so powerful. And there's so much in there. I don't even think that we could cover all of it in a full podcast, let alone, you know, five or 10 more minutes. But, um, you know, what's, what's one line or one thing out there that really stands out to you? You, you know, Shane, that that's the program in just a few sentences, you know, and it tells you what we have to do on a daily basis. You know, when we see our character defects pop up, you know, when we have these things that we used to live in, you know, our selfishness and our dishonesty, our resentment, our, our fear, when those things pop up, you know, it tells us what we do in very clear cut directions as to what to do if we want relief. First, we ask God to remove them at once. We discuss them with someone immediately, not next week or the next time we see somebody or the next meeting we go to. Immediately, we make amends quickly if we've hurt somebody. And then we resolutely turn. It's not that we go help somebody, you know, next Saturday, we re- <laughs> turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, that, that is just clear cut direction. And if we can learn to do that, uh, when we, you know, on a daily basis, uh, we will start, you know, increasing our conscious contact. We'll have a better yeah. life. I mean, just a, a very free life, you know, and the next sentence after that says, and we have ceased fighting anything and anyone, even alcohol. And that goal for me is to quit fighting anyone about anything and live in live in peace and joy, you know, and and this program wakes me up spiritually so I can do that. You know, one thing I do want to mention about working the steps, uh, if let's say I'm working with someone and they have a anger issue and they're really angry, we'll go ahead and talk about something if they're really having a problem and go ahead and work. Do, do like a mini ninth step or a mini fourth step, whatever we need to do to, to get rid of that anger, you know, immediately and start working on that first. And then we'll catch up with everything else. So, you know, uh, you know, if they're angry at a person, have they, you know, teach them some tools to use, like praying for the person, you know, will help with that. And, you know, and different tools they can use to get over that anger uh, while we're working the rest of the steps. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. We'll, do that in the middle you know we won't wait until we get to the ninth step in you know seven eight months you know if they if they're hurting you know with something in particular what about Uh, what what about trying to work with with somebody who uh uh who just doesn't think that or that they really need to work the steps i mean i guess that's kind of up to them right um you know but i I uh, just i don't know how do you address something like that i just you know, what I've done in the past is um, I would tell them that, you know, if they're if I'm going to be their sponsor, we're going to work the steps. If if they don't want to work the steps, they don't need me because that's why yeah. I'm there. Yeah. So I mean, I won't be ill or rude with them, but, um, you know, I, I'm not a you know, I'm not a marriage counselor or financial counselor or anything else. I'm, I'm there to help them show them how I did it. And I got relief from working the steps. And that's why I'm there. You know, yeah. so, um, but I'll, that's what I'll tell. But usually I don't have that problem. Uh, they'll quit coming around or quit calling me because they're going to meet with me every week. If we're, <laughs> so if they don't show up, you know, they're gone, you know, yeah. and this, uh, you know, it, it, it works itself out. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I felt impressed. I needed to start taking on sponsees. I show up at a meeting, a guy sitting beside me says, man, I've been needing a sponsor. Will you sponsor me? First time I walked in at that particular meeting. And the day that I said, you know, I think God's going to start sending me some sponsees, that responsive obedience is uh, yeah. is learning to, to walk in that all the time is an issue, Shane, because I still think so much about me and, and, and miss my opportunities a lot of times, you know? 
Well, at the same time, though, too, is is in a situation like that, you've allowed that door to open. And so for a long time, and I'll speak for myself, and I'm sure you would agree with this, for a long time in our own struggles, th- those doors were closed. And they were closed damn tight, and they were deadlocked, and they had a chain crossed around them, and you couldn't get in. You know, and, and that's why for me, I wasn't experiencing life on the level that I'm so grateful that I get to experience today because I wasn't allowing God to work in me. I wasn't allowing the things in. Um, I was I was closing them out and then I was blaming all of those other things for why nothing good was happening to me. You know, and so my my point to this is is for anyone out there listening to just through, you know, my own experience in that I can, I can a hundred percent say that once I cracked that door just a little bit, man, and I just like opened up just a little bit, um, you know, slowly, but surely things started to happen and started to change. And, uh, that that's really all, that's really all I had to do was just, you know, relax a little bit and open up, man. And it's, it's been such a huge, uh, such a huge change, um, for me just in, in the last four, four and a half years. And I know plenty of other people, buddy, plenty of other folks and friends that are in recovery who've experienced the same thing. So, uh, you can do it too, is what I'm saying. A little, little motivation for you. Agreed, man. Agreed. You know, and you don't have to work a program like, you know, like I do or like you do. I know yeah. you go to recovery and you'll, you'll go to an, an AA meeting. Occasionally I go to a meeting a week, an AA meeting a week and other people I know go every day and then other people who work a recovery online mostly. Uh, so there's a lot of different, you know, ways to go about this. You know, uh, I think the point is what you said about being willing is just submitting it to whatever God you believe and say, okay, I'm ready. You know, I'm willing, just do it yeah. and see what happens. Just hold on, see what happens. Yeah. And you're about opening the doors, you know, God don't open doors till it's time to walk through them. I just realized that recently, you know, mm. I always wanted five doors to be open that I was going to go through a, a year from now. You don't open the door till it's the moment to step through. Yeah. Here I was stressed because things didn't look like they were working out and they, they opened it as I needed them to open, you know, <laughs> I, I stressed all that time for nothing, you know, <laughs> I've, I've been, I've been saying this for a long time and this actually came from, um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, coach Nordhues. I'm sorry. I said Mr. Nordhues. He was a teacher also, but he was also my baseball coach in high school. And there was one thing that he said to me one time that always stuck out. And I still say it till today. And I was, I don't even remember what the situation was. I was going through something. I was a young, you know, kid trying to, you know, I was barely squeaking by. I barely had good enough grades to play baseball. That was the only reason I was in there. And he goes, he looked at me one day and he goes, Hey, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? And I kind of found this funny coming from a, a, a coach too, because it's kind of morbid, but it made a lot of sense to me. And it still does today. He said, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I said, I don't know. He goes, you're going to die. (laughs) <laughs> and I know that might sound kind of goofy to some people out there, but to me, like that really puts things in perspective for me every day because that is the worst thing that's going to happen. I'm going to die one day. Okay. And it's not something I think about and it's not something I'm really afraid of. It, it just, it is. But what it does for me is it puts things in, into perspective for me to know that I don't have to carry this weight of the world on my shoulders at the end of the day. It's, it's not, you know, there's nothing I can ultimately do about most things except my attitude, my response to things, all those, all those things that we talk about here so often in recovery. Um, and I'm not going to worry about that kind of stuff, you know, and that I think to bring it back around full circle, I mean, that goes back to the powerlessness, um, that, that you and I have talked about since the first time we ever met up until, you know, last Thursday when we met until today, we're having this conversation, man. Uh, it's good stuff. And I just, I can't, um, put enough emphasis on uh, finding somebody to work with is it an accountability partner, a sponsor, a friend, whatever the the heck you want to call it. Uh, it, it, you know, just get together with a group, with a person, like find somebody to work with, man. I mean, it's so, it's so important and it will, it will take you to that next level, buddy, man. It's, it's been really, uh, an honor to have you back on the show. It's an honor to work with you, man. I just appreciate our, our friendship, our work that we do together, man. And it's just, it's so cool, man. It's, uh, uh, it's just God doing for us, man. Right. <laughs> it is, and I, and I get so much out of it and, uh, and I, I, I appreciate the opportunity too, Shane. Thanks. Anything else you want to add before we wrap this up? Man, we hit it all, my friend. It was, uh, I, for me really, uh, the learning to submit was the hardest part. And that that's what 
brought more relief than anything is learning how to be powerless and continuing yeah. to learn that. And it's something I have to do on a daily basis and learning how to submit more parts of my life and be powerless in more areas and being freer in more areas. Cause the more I submit and the more I'm powerless, the freer, freer I am. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Well, thank you again. And, uh, you can go to that sober guy.com for more information. If you want, uh, uh any resources, if you want to li- listen to some of the past episodes, there's all kinds of different, uh, different episodes with different guests and different content. And then also be sure to, uh, to go back and check out episode 117. Um, that was buddy's first episode titled, do I need a sponsor where we, we covered some more, uh, some more content on, um, you know, why you need a sponsor and what that might look like and how you might be able to find it. Uh, Love you guys. Thanks again for tuning in. Peace, love, respect. Keep your blood clean.